Courtney Lewis. And I'm Tony Nichol, the Director of Artistic with the Jacksonville Symphony. Welcome to the very first Martini Monday. We're going to each week teach you how to make a martini and then answer questions about the Jacksonville Symphony. So today we're going to start with my favourite drink of all, which is a Hendrix Martini, a gin martini. Now some of you who've been with the Jacksonville Symphony as fans for a while might have seen me make this on television on The View a couple of years ago, or The Chat. The Chat. The Chat. The local one. Um, but since it's a very important drink that I drink most days of the week, I wanted to have a little bit of a session for you to know how to make it. So, two ingredients in Hendrix gin, and second of all, vermouth. Dry vermouth. Dry vermouth, yeah. Now, Hendrix gin is from Scotland, and it's got a really nice, very soft, elegant, cucumbery flavour, so we're going to garnish it later with a cucumber. Instead of an olive, which you may sometimes see with martini. Exactly. Now, how much of this and how much of this you use is very much a matter of taste. To be honest, I never use any of this. I just put the gin into a martini shaker and shake it. But since I'm teaching you, we're going to do it by the book. So, martini, full of, martini shaker full of ice. And we're going to do seven parts of this gin to one part of the dolin. So, here we go. One, let's speed this up. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those of you who are real martini drinkers will just let the light shine through the bottle of vermouth into the shaker rather than actually putting it in. Tony, you're much better at shaking than me, so I think you should give us my best. best. All right. Best and, and 20, 20 seconds at least, not, not uh, you know, just to mix it up and cool it down. You want a little bit of dilution. You want a little bit of ice shaving. Or you could just stir this if you prefer then instead of shaking. Yeah. There we are. That is really important because quite often when you make a martini at home, we forget to shake for long enough and then it doesn't taste very nice. Okay, then we split it into two glasses. Some nice fluffy crystal glasses here. If you like Julia Child. <laughs> Except we haven't been drinking before we filmed. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're adding a garnish of a cucumber on the side. Lovely. And that Thank is you. a Hendrix Martini. Cheers. Cheers. It's pretty good. It is very good. Wonderful job. Thank you for making that. Shall we go through? Yep. Right. So one of the questions that I get from patrons often is why we seat the orchestra in the way that we do, specifically with the, the strings. The two questions I normally get are, we often sit differently than a lot of American orchestras, which has uh, first violins on the left and the cellos on the right and the other strings in between, violas and second violins. And, and then sometimes we sit with the violins opposite each other, the first violins and the second violin. So what uh, guides you as to how you seat um, the strings here in Jacksonville? So, it's quite a long answer. <laughs> um, we don't really know how orchestras sat uh, until we get to Haydn's time, so until we get to the late 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, before that, it changed too often, and the whole idea of an orchestra as a set number of instruments hadn't really taken place. And it was a, a continual orchestra with yeah. a you know, harpsichord in buried yeah. in there as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But when we get to Haydn, um, Haydn spent a long time working for one guy, for a Prince Esterhazy in Austria, and he had an orchestra of about 40 people there. And that's kind of the beginning of classicism, if you like. Um, and we know from diagrams of their stage layouts that he had violins on either side. So the first song, the conductor's left, the audience is left, and the second's on the right. And you can see in the way that Haydn writes symphonies that he expected that because he'll quite often have a conversation between the first. They'll play something da -da -da -da, and the seconds will play da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives you a kind of classical stereo effect. If all the violins are together, first and seconds, you don't hear it because it's all coming from the same place. Um, so that seating of first and seconds opposite each other began to, was, was standard from Haydn's time. We see Mozart and Beethoven also writing for that all the time. The Beethoven symphonies are full of 
what we call antiphony, antiphonal effects between the first and seconds. Mm -hmm. Antiphony just means different spaces. Um, and we see it all the way through, even in the early 20th century, with composers like Mahler and Elgar, who also yeah. expected this kind of thing. Um, so that was normal. And then two people came along, both English actually. First of all, a conductor, Henry Wood, um, in England, who was the founder of the proms. And also in America, Leopold Stokowski. He was English, although he spoke with this very peculiar. Adaptation. Yeah, it's sort of. Yeah somewhere in middle Europe, kind of. And, and people would know him. He was uh, the conductor who conducted um, Disney's Fantasia. That's right. And in Looney Tunes, that's usually who Bugs Bunny was sort of was imitating. imitating. That's right, yeah. yeah. And of course, he was music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra, so he was well known in America. Um, he, put, he rearranged the orchestra in all sorts of different ways. Um, there's one famous story of him scandalizing the Philadelphia board because he put all the wind instruments at the front of the stage and kept all the strings behind. And the board was upset, not because it sounded bad, but because it looked like the wind instruments didn't have enough to do to warrant being at the front of the stage. So his idea was to put the, viol the strings, um, first violins, second violins, violas, cellos and basses, kind of in order of descending pitch. And that was because he felt it was easier to play that way. And it is easier to play that way. You've got you know, the first and seconds often play the same thing, or they play in octaves. And if you imagine if they're split, the distance between the back of the seconds all the way stage right, and the first all the way stage left, is really big. Um, and in the Academy of Ancient Music in Philadelphia, they couldn't hear each other, so he put everybody together. Um, the problem is, like I said, that you lose the effect of the violins together um, in classical repertoire. That change was called the Stokowski shift. Um, and it became really popular all over America and also in Europe. And by about 1930, it's pretty much standard. And the effect that that has is that composers begin to write for the orchestra that way. So if you look at music from the 30s, um, Shostakovich V, for example, a little bit later, um, 1940s, he divides the, the violins into three, and that assumes that they're all sitting together because you can't divide two and three. Um, so my point is always that you should play whatever the composer wrote. Um, that means that we sometimes have to change the way the orchestra is set up during a concert, which is which can be difficult. Yeah. Because what would be um, an example of some music that is more advantageous in the the newer setting with with the violins together? Um, Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, um, Shostakovich again. Uh, anything 20th century, basically. They, that right. kind of idea of antiphony disappears a lot more. Um, and and when, with con so many concerts tending to have a uh, chronological uh, progression from the beginning of the concert to the end, um, uh, something cl classical like Haydn or Mozart in the, in the first half and then more romantic in the second half, it may require that shift at, uh, at the interval. That's right. And one of the things that we're really lucky about in Jacksonville is that we have a really really good concert hall. And the reason why I've been able to keep doing this is because the first violins and the second violins can hear each other relatively well. Now, if you ask them, I bet they'll tell you that they can't, but I can tell you that the feeling of being on the podium is that actually the ensemble is very good. Um, in other cities, it, it's much more difficult. Um, when I was assistant conductor in uh, Minnesota and New York, both those orchestras gave up sitting with antiphonal violins. They just thought it was because too difficult. Because the acoustic was not good enough. wasn't clear yeah. enough, and yeah. the musicians hated it. And the conductors, Osmar Vanska and Alan Gilbert, both capitulated in the end to allowing them to sit the way that they wanted to. Um, we're really lucky that we have the opportunity here to be able to do both ways. When you do put the violins together, you still have the violas on the outside rather than inside of the cellos. So what, what is that, and what factors into that decision? Yeah, so when the Jacksonville Symphony sits the violins together, we have first, seconds, cellos and basses, violas, violas on the outside, which I think was the way Roger Nirenberg had the orchestra sitting, but it wasn't the way Fabio Getty did. Um, the idea behind that is taste. First of all, a lot of European orchestras, Vienna and Berlin, sit like that. And in the States, Cleveland sits, sits like that as well. So the most sort of European orchestra of all in America sits, sits like that. The idea is that in um, 
Baroque music and the music of the 17th and 18th centuries, the bass is really important. Everything's built up around the continuo and the, the, the double basses and the cellos. And that meant that those instruments were in the center of the stage. I feel like when you put the cellos and basses on the side, they're not in the middle of the texture anymore. And I miss them being at the center. Yeah. So I like to feel that richness coming from the middle of the stage. So uh, if, if our patrons were to have a couple of different pieces to listen for next time we program them that really exemplify this conversational way of writing that uh, com these composers had in uh, the class classical period. Um, what would be a couple of really uh, well-known standard rep symphonies? So um, in the Beethoven symphonies, the Eroica number three, um, the fifth and the ninth all have lots and lots of this kind of antiphonal stuff. Um, any Mahler symphony is full of it the whole way through. And a, a, an unusual example, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, The Pathétique, the finale, which goes da -di -da -dum, da -da, he divides each note of that melody between the first and second. So it actually goes da ba ba bi ba ba, which is a very disorientating thing when you hear it. And again, something that's totally lost if the violins are all right. stuck together, right. as they usually are in that piece right. nowadays, which is a shame. Well, thank you for outlining that. That's really fascinating, uh, something that seems like it is a, an easy to overlook detail, but it makes a huge acoustic difference. And it ac actually emphasizes why one should hear music played live, because yeah. that's also something that gets lost a little bit in the digital experience. That's right. So, that's right. Well, thank you for this. My pleasure. Thank you for the excellent Hendrix Martini. It's my pleasure. And, um, before we cheers, we would love to hear from you about what you would like us to talk about. Yes. So if you have any questions, please write them in the thread under this video or send me a message on Facebook and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Absolutely. Cheers. cheers.